All right, I assume that we're recording because you didn't tell me that we're recording. So for real now, it's showtime, baby. How'd you know I was recording? Because I always know you're when you're recording. I just know. Also, I'm just going to keep saying it's showtime, baby, Why just over you... and over and over. <laughs> until... Why are you obsessed with that right I, now? I, I don't know. It's just It's kind of just in my head. Can you can you give me like a like a Wayne's World like and five four for what you know the countdown thing my countdown hand countdown to what countdown to being on air we're live countdown to it's showtime baby it's showtime baby you don't get a countdown you just gotta be ready okay well always be ready I'm always I am always ready go I'm ready to podcast at any given moment in time okay this moment the last moment the next moment this coming moment. These moments, like tears in the rain, I am ready to podcast. It is not like tears in the rain. It is like tears in rain. Get it right or pay the price. What's the price? I don't know. But there is no extra the don't misquote Sorry. The impro- improvised I've, I've, line I've, from Blade Runner. I, I, one of the most beautiful improvised lines in the history of cinema. Welcome to Culture Just Weird. I'm Chris. I'm Kayla. And this is Rucker Hauer. He's here too. I, he's here in spirit. I... Have a, I think a pretty exciting show for you today. Oh, why? I I don't know. It's just why, how dare you? I, <laughs> why would I, you? Yeah, do I decided this? to buck the trend of culture just weird and actually do some exciting material that people you, might like. What do you mean exciting? Um, it's got twists. And I don't want to spoil it. So, oh but God. it's got some. It's got some dramatic elements. All right. To it. You kind of seem like you're ready and raring to go. I am ready and raring to go. Uh, any business or banter that we want to cover before? Yes. We have a business. Oh, we do. Holy shit. We have a business about our Patreon. We do. www.patreon.com slash culture just weird. That's right. Where you can check out bonus content, outtakes, cute little video game sprites from the Zumba video game we're going to do one day. Uh, you can read our polls. scripts. You can take polls. Lots of stuff going on over at the Patreon. You can comment at us and we will reply back. Although, to be fair, we will also do that on Twitter and Instagram and anywhere else. True. But whatever. But the business we have for our Patreon is that we are restructuring our patron tiers oh, in the upcoming correct. weeks. So currently we have four different patron tiers and we kind of think that's too much gatekeeping. Yeah, because it's like Tears in the rain. It's like tears in in rain. There is no second the. <laughs> Sorry. There's no the. Tears. It's Patreon tears in rain, and we're just going to wash away some of them. We're going to wash away some of these tears. We we don't want to have so much gatekeeping going on. We're going to slim it down. We're going to streamline. I think we've decided we're going to have two tears. I think two moving tears. Forward. So just yeah. like a little baby. One like, for each eye. One one tear in the rain for, you know, if you just want to, like, dip your toe in the Culture's Weird Patreon waters and, you know, another tier for if you're absolutely obsessed with us. You're which, hardcore. You know, hardcore just like us. So if you are a current Patreon patron, uh, keep an eye out for those changes. And if you are interested in joining our Patreon, becoming patrons, you can go to Culture Just Weird. Wait, no, patreon.com slash Culture Just Weird. Yes. Uh, you can go now and we'll and subscribe and then we'll change the tiers or you can wait until we change the tiers in rain and then subscribe then yes and we also need to catch up on something that we promised uh a a patron tier that we did not do uh so we will do that next episode we're going to catch up on our shout outs so there's like a bunch of subscribers that we have that we owe some shout outs some we said we'd do some public shout outs on the show we owe shout outs i think it's probably too much to do a shout out every single episode because that would that would get pretty spammy but we will make good. We will definitely do the shout tier. outs for yeah for that tier and or for those folks. Keep an eye out for those changes to our Patreon, which I think will only make it better and brighter. Yeah, and and I think we've been doing a pretty good job this season. Bro, some I made bonus content, video game sprites, and, and we have a video. We do an have actual, a video. Honest to goodness, video. You guys, we found Tartaria. Yeah, Tartaria, all around Los Angeles. Uh, so go check it out. It's um. Yeah, there's some good stuff there. There's some good stuff there. And or don't, or don't check or it don't. out. Or just listen to the podcast and enjoy it, because that's the main thing that we want you to do. Absolutely. So that's enough about our Patreon. Just wanted to give that quick little business update. But right now, I'm just excited to hear what your exciting topic is, because you've been you've been a busy little beaver the last couple of days, just really <laughs> digging into this research and this and this script writing. I, I want to know what you what you've uncovered. Well, first, thank you for the business. Thank you for giving us the business, Kayla. As always. We all appreciate it. 
And I have one more. I, this is pseudo business, um, but I want to start today's episode. Before we get into the meat of the topic, I do want to just say something real quick about the Stop Anti-Asian Hate Movement. I don't really have anything in my script about this. It's more just off the cuff, and I just want to acknowledge it and say that it's an important movement that's happening in the U.S. right now, and there's lots of important things going on, so it's really hard to keep track of this stuff. But just as sort of like, I don't know, like a, a tribute or dedicate or whatever, this episode is maybe semi-dedicated, if that's a thing, to that movement, and we will put a link to stopaapihate.org. Um, I mean, there's that's the link. We'll also put it in the show notes, um, and I'll probably post it on Twitter as well. Um, That's an organization that was actually started last year in 2020 in response to some of the anti-Asian hate that was that was cropping up as a result of, unfortunately, you know, the pandemic and the way that it was you know handled in China and then responded to here and and discrimination cropped up a lot based on uh, primarily on our, our the United States response to where the where the pandemic originated. Um, and of course, there's a lot of history behind, you know, our, our discrimination there, which actually we'll be talking about in a little bit. But I just wanted to dedicate this episode sort of to that, and and we'll we'll put a link. But yeah, so that organization was started last year. That uh, there was a group of folks that asked the government to start tracking anti Asian hate crimes, um, and the government declined to do that. The United States government declined to do that, and so they started doing it on their own. Which that aspect of sort of like mutual aid. Uh, grassroots, um, you know, the Asian community helping itself when no help is given is something that we'll get to that. But yeah, so I'll put a link in our show notes and you can go there. There's there's a donation button, there's a newsletter, um, but primarily it's it's there to help track uh, anti-Asian hate crimes and it's they're a good group. So that's that's my extra business. Good business. Are you now ready to get started? I... And I was born ready. Because I don't really have another good place to put the cold open music. So it's going here. Predictably enough, we are starting this episode of mine again with a question. I got answers for days. So put your thinking hat on. On. It's, I'm it's about to do the thing. Snug. That you totally love. I know you love it when I put you on the spot. Just ask the question, man. My question for you today is, in your opinion, what is a government? Don't think I don't think about this a lot. Uh, I, I'm sure you do. It's a made-up thing. You think about a bunch of dumb shit all yeah. the time, as do I. It's an entirely made-up... It's a tulpa. It's a government is a tulpa? Well, okay. It basically is. I kind of mean, like, what is what is the nature of a government? Like, what is the what is it for? Like, what does it do? A government is the body that has either taken power or had power bestowed upon it in order to organize a group of people in a society so like that meme this is a society yes but it is the the group of people (laughs) that are in charge of making that happen and that can you Mm. know be authoritarian where it's like they just decide or it can be representative which ostensibly we're supposed to have but i don't know if we have that much do you think we could you could have even a society that could even exist without a representative democracy no (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Like a society of humans. Could a society of humans exist without a government? I mean, there are historically groups of people who believe so. I mean, that's like Mm -hmm. we make fun of anarchists, but silly anarchists. The anarchy movement is very much about that. And I think that it's a little bit of um, we kind of 
folks who aren't anarchists or who don't engage with that far left of a uh, political viewpoint maybe think of anarchists as just like, yeah, burn it down. And then we all just like run around beating each other with baseball bats. And I've really, seen The Purge. I know how it goes. <laughs> that's not necessarily, it's not generally what most anarchists are advocating for. It's more about self-regulation amongst communities rather than a governing body regulating communities. Hmm. So you would say that some folks would argue that you you could have a society without a government, but it sounds like you're also saying that depending, maybe if you define it more broadly, then the, or at least you would say that the aspects, the, some of the things the government does currently would still have to be taken care of as a service. Sort of what you were saying there about like, you know, the, the self-regulation and the self, you know, the mutual sort of aid and that sort right. of thing. I don't know enough about like the anarchist school of thought to say whether or not I think I don't know. I guess it's my I don't know. I don't know enough about Yeah. Well, this isn't really about anarchism. This to is to say whether or not you can have a governmentless society. Probably. Yeah. I mean, like you think about uncontacted tribes, I don't know if they have governments, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I guess it depends on how you define it, but this is yeah, this is less about commentary on an anarchist movement and more just like you know, getting your your brain thoughts about what government is and what services it provides. I think it would probably do all of us a lot of good to try and envision a world with a type of government very different than the one that we have just for the mm -hmm. just for just to reimagine what we might be capable of instead of just like, well, this is what it is. Yeah. Obviously, I had to write some stuff down here just to so I, you know, had my own ideas and, and so I could respond to you. I think that I, in my mind, and this is, again, I am not a scholar about this sort of, I'm not a political science major or recipient of any sort of degree in political science. This is just my own ranting. But I feel like, to me, there's three elements that are like, if you just really boil it down and strip everything away, like, what are the fundamental essences? The like, judicial, the, the executive, <laughs> and the third one that I never remember. Third one. What's the third Legislative. One? Thank you. <laughs> That's because they don't do anything. Um, oh, zing, zinger, get get dunked on. Big anarchist the over Senate. here. So for for me, the three elements are the creation and enforcement of rules, so that a society can actually function, right? So in our case, that's law, law enforcement, that sort of thing. I think a so second cops. Yeah, cops. Yay, cops. So you think you have to have cops? I don't think you have to have cops. I think you do have to have a set of rules that people agree on, and there has to be a way to redress deviance from those rules and from agreements that people come into with each other. Gotcha. Um, I think the second element would be mutual aid. So okay. in our society, that would be things like Social Security or welfare or food stamps or whatever. Can there be a society where you don't have those things, but people's needs are still taken care of? Uh, I think so, which is why I say mutual aid and not like government services. Gotcha. Right. I'm trying to be like as neutral and broad with these things, thinking about these things as I can. Right. And I think that and, and, and that's also on purpose. Right. Because we just talked about like, you know, in an anarchist society, if you still have mutual aid, if that still is an, a necessary service for humans to have to live together then is that still a government or no? I would almost say yes. Like if I'm, if you're defining it as broadly and neutrally as I am, I would say yes. And I would right. even say that in that society, you still need rules, mm -hmm. right? You still need a way to enforce agreements between people when there's a dispute, right? right? People will always have disputes, good faith, good natured people that are acting in what they believe is their, you know, their truth will still have disputes, okay. right? Is this, is this, is this topic, whether or not the U.S. is a cult. Yeah, we're finally doing it. No, you always actually... <laughs> Capitalism's a cult. <laughs> but, but, Capitalism isn't a government, bruh. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why Capitalism I Capitalism is an economic system. Anyway, my third element was just... Thank you uh, for mansplaining that to me. I well, appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, you you know, you're, you're kind of slow, as our listeners know. So... You really want... Is that really what you want to say on our podcast? Uh-huh. Yeah. You're a nice guy. <laughs> Go go ahead, Mr. Judicial. I would say Mr. That. Mr. Pro Cop over here. Now, do you understand what economics is? Mm -hmm. oh, you, you, do you, you want to sit in here and talk I'm about... I'm making fun of myself. ...how one could make an argument that 
capitalism has become our system of government, sir. Okay, sir. Let's let's move on. Excuse so me, we, sir. Because we don't have time to talk about like the political corporate environment that we find <laughs> ourselves in. Uh, the third one I was just, and again, this is just me, but I think that a government also has to, in some way, offer or promise power and rewards to the governing class in exchange for the risks of leadership and security roles. I, I feel like that is something that has been present throughout most of time, right? Like a king or a queen is not just a king or queen because of their servant leadership role. They're also a king or queen because, ooh, that's powerful. And that's, you know, I want to pass that down to my lineage. And there's there's this, certainly this like personal power element. Even in today's, you know, I say right. king or queen, but like, you know, are people running for president because they truly want to serve society or are they doing it because it's that like... sweet, sweet post-presidency book mm, deal. Prestige, right, right, exactly. That's the thing. I think that for in order for us to get to a place where we function more harmoniously as a people, figuring out how to have that power be kind of as little as possible, that power, that prestige, that fame, that wealth, probably behooves us to make sure that that's not too big of a piece of the pie yes and i also want to say no like yes and no right and so the the way i see it is that third element is not so much i think power is a type of reward that has been offered to the tribal leadership right historically whether that's a president or a king or a chief or whatever right Um, but i do think that there needs to be some sort of like reward some sort of incentive because being in a leadership role actually does tend to be risky. Sure. And it does tend to, you know, it's it's its own service that's being provided. So there needs to be some sort of, like, reward in exchange for that. Now, it's, you know, obviously, like, unlimited and eternal power over your fellow humans is not, not probably great. the best reward to have. But I think that that is an element. Anyway, all that discussion, I want you to just keep it in the back of your mind. That absolutely rock-solid definition that we just came up with as two highly qualified political science researchers as we dig into today's topic. Is it in the back of your head? Yes. Okay. It's it's honestly it, it went one ear and right out the, right it's out not, the it other. It fell out of the back of your head. No, I'm just stuck on the reward thing. <laughs> I mean, that that's just me. Like I don't know. I didn't I didn't read like on the nature of government. Right. Like I didn't read like Plato's Republic or anything like to <laughs> Ew. You know who reads? So, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I had to do a lot of other reading for this episode. Let's this crack was just out a me copy of Anarchy State and speculating Utopia. on right, speculating on the nature of government for reasons that will hopefully become clear later. All right, but in order to dig in today's topic, let's start at the logical starting place and time. The Big Bang. The date is. <laughs> The date is May 27th, 1644. My favorite date. And things are about to change at Shanghai Pass. Shanghai Pass is a key strategic point along the Great Wall, abutting the Bohai Sea on the eastern edge of China and only about 200 miles from China's historical and current capital of Beijing. On this day, when spring was giving way to summer in China, another transition was also about to take place. The Battle of Shanghai Pass is considered to be the decisive engagement, and that's among a huge network of events spanning from around 1610 to 1680, but this battle is considered to be the decisive engagement in the fall of the Ming Dynasty in China, in the victory of its successor dynasty from Manchuria, the Qing. Kayla, by now, you surely know, if not the topic, at least where I got the idea for this topic, right? I absolutely know what you're talking about because I pointed it out and I said, what's this? You should look it up. Maybe it's a cult. Yeah, so so <laughs> let's let's catch up our listeners. Until a few days ago, I was all ready to go with a different topic other than this one. But I like it wasn't super happy with it. Like it was interesting and I may still do it again in the future, so I'm not going to say what it was. But the story just like it wasn't popping out at me the way that sure. I usually like to have it do, you know. But luckily, I was saved by the bell, as Kayla and I here were taking a lovely walk through Chinatown in Los Angeles. And we totally had one of those, let's call it a best friends moment, (laughs) where you just see something that makes you go, huh, what? What? Wait, what is, what's that? What's, 
There's definitely more to this thing than I just saw that meets the eye. I can just, I can just tell. I can just smell it. And for those of you who are not longtime listeners, best friends, I, I, I call it best friends moment because that was our first episode. That was the first thing that got us into this. And we had one of those moments where we were like, something about this place feels a little odd. We were volunteering there. It's an animal and sanctuary. And there was some conversations we had that perked our ears up. And there was like a weird logo that was going on that Best Friends has. The fact that it's called Best Friends now that I think about it is a little, I don't know. Anyway, we had one of those moments for Kayla and I the other evening as we were walking by a building with a brightly green colored sign, a peculiar yellow logo, and calling itself a benevolent association. I love that phrase. Specifically in this case, the topic of today's show, the Hop Sing Tong Benevolent Association. But Kayla, I digress. Let's get back to 17th century Chinese history, shall we? Sure. So we left off with the Qing Dynasty supplanting the Ming, which had ruled China for nearly 300 years prior to its fall in 1644. One of the many interesting things to appreciate about the Ming Dynasty is that it was a sort of native nationalist ruling class. The Han Chinese, which broadly speaking considered themselves the sort of like true native Chinese, were the ruling class in the Ming Dynasty. And now keep in mind here, we are applying like modern Western exonyms, like even like the word China is like a Western word, obviously. And when the people that lived in like what we'd call China, they were hugely diverse, both in terms of ethnicity, nationality, geopolitical organization. So the words we're using here, even like Ming, Qing, Chinese, whatever, it's like they're very sloppy to use. There's a lot more precision that we could apply here if we had the time. But we're just going to sort of power through. And also, I don't like have the historical chops to go into the those nuances in real detail. But I just want to say that as like a, a disclaimer that these words are broad and sloppy when we're using them here in the West in 2021 on this podcast. Dan Carlin, if you're listening. <laughs> please help Dan please Carlin. Please do a supplemental episode for us. Yeah, for real. So... Broadly speaking, the thing to understand about the Ming is that they were sandwiched between Mongol rule of China, i.e. what Han Chinese people would have considered outsider rule, and Qing rule of China, who were a Manchurian people, and Han Chinese would have also considered outsider rule. So why do I mention all of this? Now, the Qing, by the way, might have disagreed with that, right? They might have, they, and in fact, there's, you know, I read some stuff about like the way they consider, like the way the different groups consider what was really China and what was like outside of China, what was inside of China. There was a lot of, there was, there was disagreement about that among different groups. Um, but why do I mention all this? Well, to introduce you to the idea that the Qing dynasty faced a substantial internal opposition to their rule. Of course, this opposition wasn't entirely ethno-nationalist. It would be irresponsible to suggest that. It wasn't entirely just Han Chinese saying, you know, get out of our lands. Uh, That was only one element. But here, let me read the Wikipedia entry for, and this is, the entry is anti-Qing sentiment. So the opening entry for that reads, quote, anti-Qing sentiment refers to sentiment principally held in China against Manchu rule during the Qing dynasty. How are there Wikipedia pages on shit that was going on in the 1600s? You know what I mean? It's insane. <laughs> well, because it's history, and so Wikipedia has a lot of history stuff that's been... Tra- Wikipedia has everything. History's crazy, guys. <laughs> so it refers to the sentiment principally held in China against Manchu rule during the Qing dynasty, which was criticized by opponents as being barbaric. The Qing was accused of destroying traditional Han culture by forcing Han to wear their hair and a queue in the Manchu style. So a queue is like, if you imagine sort of like the, you know, the bald front of the head with the long like ponytail, mm-hmm. that's a queue. It was blamed for suppressing Chinese science and for causing China to be transformed from the world's premier power to a poor backwards nation. The rallying slogan of anti-Qing activists was, and I'm totally going to fuck this up, sorry, but... Uh, Fan Qing Fu Ming, which translates to oppose Qing and restore Ming. Oh. In the, yeah, pretty, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, in the broadest sense, an anti-Qing activist was anyone who was engaged in anti-Manchu direct action. This included people from many mainstream political movements and uprisings, such as the Taiping Rebellion, the, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fuck up some of these too, sorry, Xinhai Revolution, the Revolt of the Three Feudatories, 
the Revive China Society, the Tong Menghui, the Panthe Rebellion, the White Lotus Rebellion, and others. End quote. Now, anytime you have a regime change, you're going to have loyalists. That's just human nature, anytime throughout history, right? Ming loyalist sentiment, however, was robust and long-lasting, as you can tell just from that short list of rebellious movements I just read. The White Lotus Rebellion, the last one I read, is particularly interesting because of its instigators, the White Lotus Society. And it's not just interesting because Magic the Gathering has a Black Lotus... Got to bring up Magic the Gathering. I'm sorry. How does that have anything to do with anything that you're talking about? Because right White Lotus. I had to say Black Lotus. Black Lotus is the most expensive magic card. It's we, like the most famous magic we card. We know, sir. <sighs> anyway. Get back to your script. Fine. I need to know how what was going on in the <laughs> 1600s relates to the building we walked by in Chinatown the other day where I said, what is that? It has a members only sign and you Googled it and then your eyes went all big and you tucked your phone quickly in your pocket and went... Oh, oh, that might that might be a topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep talking about the White Lotus Society then, which was a secret religious society. Favorite. That appealed to Han Chinese. And in case it wasn't obvious from their rebellion, they weren't too fond of Qing rule. Now, in case it isn't obvious, we could do a whole podcast series on like pretty much every single sentence I've said so far in this episode. Yeah. You could do a whole series on Mongolian rule of China, on Ming rule on the Qing, on those transitionary periods. Multiple episodes of on all of On opposition these to yeah. the Qing, on the White Lotus Society. All of these things individually are extremely deep and complex topics on their own. But we must bravely forge on ahead so I can answer the question you just asked me. I bring up the White Lotus Society not to talk about them in particular, but to talk about their organizational descendants. What does that mean? So that's just like successor organizations. So, okay. so like know, how Best some... Friends was a successor to... The yeah, great example. Church of the Millennium, like actually that. <laughs> um, not as direct as that. I would say. Okay. I would say it's more like, I don't know, something like you know Freemasonry and the Bavarian Illuminati. Maybe I don't know, something more like that. Freemasons birthed the Illuminati. The Illuminati, the Bavarian Illuminati, were a organization well, within an organization. It was the Illuminati was in the okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe more like that, but it's I, you know, there's also like. There's no real perfect analogy. Um, just think of it as like a successor organization that borrowed the same, a lot of the same, you know, traditions and same. Um, the actually, White Lotus had actually, a baby is what and, you're saying. Yeah, you can think of it maybe a little bit like a Catholicism and, uh, you know, pick your Protestant religion, right? Something like that, where you have like Catholicism and then you have the Church of England. Okay. All right, because this, don't forget, this was also, I said this was a secret religious sect. Right. Right. Secret religious sex. Sex, yeah. They were, there were a bunch of sex, actually. So you could even say sex. Just sex all over the place. One of the most important descendant organizations is called, and I've heard this pronounced multiple different ways, so I'm just going to use the one that I can do the best. It's called the Tian Di Hui, which translates roughly to the Heaven and Earth Society. I want to be a part of that. They are also called Hongmen, which translates very roughly to Vast Family. Tian Di Hui is sort of like Eastern Freemasonry. Just mention that as an analogy. Uh, in fact, I believe they have actually even been referred to as like Chinese Freemasons. Interesting. Now, obviously, Freemasonry exists in China now as well. Oh, it does? Yeah. I mean, China, like Freemasonry is global now. I didn't know that. Like everything's everywhere. But yeah, so the, so the Hongmen slash Tian Di Hui has been referred to as Chinese Freemasons. Um, and actually... I found out in my research, secret religious societies have been historically pretty popular in China to the point where I even read that some religious scholars consider lumping them together as a fourth, quote, fourth major religious sect in China next to the big three of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. Wow. So the fourth would just be... The fourth would be like secret religion, secret, um, secret society religions. Interesting. Yeah. But back to the Tian Di Hui in specific... Like Freemasonry, it's spread far and wide. And when that happens, you get our favorite thing here on the show, schisming and splinter groups. A schism! Allow me to briefly quote another Wikipedia entry. Quote, Under British rule in Hong Kong, all Chinese secret societies were collectively seen as criminal threats oh, no. and were bundled together and defined as triads. 
Although the Hongmen might be said to have differed in its nature from the others, the name the Three Harmony Society, which was a grouping or splinter of the, one of the splinter groups of the Tianduhui, was called the Three Harmony Society, and that, in fact, is the source of the term triad, which has since become synonymous with Chinese organized crime. Because of that heritage, the Tianduhui is both controversial and prohibited in Hong Kong, end mm. quote. Just in case you were wondering about the etymology of the word Chinese triad. Just in case you played way too much GTA. <laughs> right, or watched a lot of the Hong Kong kung fu movies. But the Hongmen had other legacies other than Hong Kong triad organizations, which finally brings us to foreign shores, or rather home shores from the perspective of our American listeners. Let's talk a little bit now about the history of the Chinese-American diaspora. Again, we could fill a whole podcast series with this as a topic, so we're just going to try to hit the main beats here. We're just zipping on by. We're just kissing everything as we pass. Super fast. Yeah. You know what we're doing? We're like we're we're doing like a like a ten k. Like we're doing like a run, right. and we're running by all these delicious bakeries with just like hundreds of selections of delicious historical baked goods. Just taking a little bite and out of each go, one. No, we're just taking a whiff. We're just going. Mmm. Smell how smelly good that is. Mmm. That historical bun. See, maybe that's what you're doing, but I'm taking a bite. You're ta- if you're taking a bite, that means that you're sitting here Googling while I'm talking to you. It's... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> it's me taking a bite. <laughs> so Chinese immigration to North America is nearly as old as the European discovery of North America, with the first Chinese peoples being involved in mercantile affairs in Mexico as early as 1565. Dope. However, the scale of true immigration was actually quite small until the mid to late 1800s. By 1848, there were a mere 325 Chinese Americans living in the United States. Wow. By 1852, four years later, that number had grown to 20,000. Dang. If you like gold rush history or if you're a fan of the San Francisco 49ers, you might know what happened in America during that time span the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill, kicking off the California Gold Rush, which drew many Americans and many immigrants to America, many of them Chinese, to the American West Coast. By 1880, the number of Chinese Americans had grown to more than 300,000, of which included 10% of California's population. Now, obviously the Gold Rush alone doesn't explain this immigration boom, especially considering the Gold Rush ended somewhere around 1855, But I think most of us, with just even a casual understanding of American history, know that Chinese immigrant laborers were instrumental in construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, one of the United States' crowning engineering achievements to this day. Even I know about that. During this construction, Chinese laborers were known for their skill and some of the more challenging and dangerous aspects of construction, specifically demolition and tunnel building. Now, one of the things that I had never considered, but really became apparent to me doing the research for this episode is that most any immigration story, there is always some pull and always some push. So there's always the destination country and the home country are always things going on there are always involved somehow in the story of that immigration. It's like a reason to leave and a reason to come. Yeah. And even more than that, like, well, I guess we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. For the Chinese immigration boom of the 1800s, the pull was what we just talked about, California gold and railroad construction jobs. But there was also some push. The late 1800s saw a decline in power and prosperity of the Qing dynasty in China, which always disproportionately affects poorer populations, causing them to seek survival and prosperity elsewhere. Many Chinese emigrants were also driven away by the Taiping Rebellion of 1850, which, interestingly enough, was one of the anti-Qing rebellions we listed just a few minutes ago in the show. Anyway, as we know, America has always been a land of opportunity that has welcomed immigrants with open arms and treated them with dignity and respect. The end. (laughs) That was a sarcasm. That was a big sarcasm. Big psych. It's always interesting to learn about past immigration waves and compare it to today. Because I feel like, and maybe this is just me, but I feel like in the past like five to ten years, this current immigration panic we've been having, we tend to like maybe a little bit romanticize the past and think of America as like 
this welcoming place to immigrants because after all, my great grandparents were immigrants. So, oh like, yeah, everything is just like everything you just was came out awesome Ellis and Ellis Island. And you got a yeah. new name, and then, and then you went somewhere, and Five Goes West, and American Tale, and it was great. Right, and then we we kind of go like, well, why can't we do that today? Why are we such jerks today when we were so welcoming before? Or you get the other kind where it's like, well, my great grandparents came through Ellis Island legally, so why can't you? The unfortunate fact is we have always, always, always had the exact same attitudes towards immigrants here in America. Has it been the exact same or has it been like the same color with different shades? Uh, I think more that. In fact, what I say next here is or what I have next here in my script is that the magnitude and severity of the response has changed. But you can pretty much always sum up the American attitude towards immigration as Immigration is awesome until me and my family get here. And then after that, we got to stop letting people in. Right. Yeah. Like you can pretty much apply that to any period of American history. And like you said, there's different like flavors and different magnitudes, right. different severities. Who specifically but it's mostly always mad that. at. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And the Chinese American diaspora is no different. And in fact, I think you could make a solid argument that no immigrant group to the U.S. has been treated as poorly as Chinese immigrants. If you were to make such an argument, you'd probably want to base it on the Page Act of 1875, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, and the Geary Act of 1892. These were multi-provisional. They had a lot of stuff going on. But the core of them was that, first of all, the Page Act straight up banned immigration to the U.S. for Chinese women. The Exclusion Act of 1882 banned immigration of all Chinese laborers, man or woman, and the Geary Act extended the time span of the Exclusion Act and added additional draconian measures related to citizenship and things like that. Jeez. Let's hear from Wikipedia again. Quote, Passage of the law was preceded by, and this is about the Chinese Exclusion Act, Passage of the law was preceded by anti-Chinese violence, as well as various policies targeting Chinese migrants. The act followed the Angel, Ang Angel? A -N -G -E -L -L, Treaty of 1880, a set of revisions to the U.S.-China Burlingame Treaty of 16... I, there's going to be a test on this at the end, by the Perfect. way. You have to name all the treaties and the years they were passed. Uh, 1868, that allowed the U.S. to suspend Chinese immigration. The act was initially intended to last for 10 years, but was renewed and strengthened in 1892 with the Geary Act and made permanent in 1902. So this outright ban was made permanent in 1902. These laws attempted to stop all Chinese immigration into the United States for 10 years, with exceptions for diplomats, teachers, students, merchants, and travelers. The laws were widely evaded. The Chinese Exclusion Act was the first and remains the only law to have been implemented to prevent all members of a specific ethnic or national group from immigrating to the United States, end quote. So that's the only time where we've, like, said, hey, this is specifically at Chinese people. Like right. we've done like, things where it's like, this is specifically at these like this countries. countries. Right. And you could argue that like the, you know, the quote unquote Muslim ban from, you know, the Trump administration was ethnic oriented, but in, but in a technical couch, sense. It was couched in the language of like, this is about, right, it's about countries. these countries. Whereas the Chinese exclusion act was like Chinese people. And again, I have to ask why was this so targeted? Why was this happening? Right. Well, the next thing I have written here is, if you are wondering why all this happened... Yes, I am. The... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am, Wikipedia <laughs> and Chris Carlson. Oh, then I'm sorry for this next part of the sentence. Oh, no. Then it's possible you haven't been paying attention to the latest immigration scare in America. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to ask me that. I'm sorry. Okay, well, I, I've been paying plenty of attention, and that means... That doesn't seem to be like, oh, I know. Have I, I can restate that for the podcast. No, fuck you. you. Detailed, <laughs> intricate knowledge of the nuances of our fear. Kayla, we're just sniffing the bakeries here. Immigrant laborers in the 1800s. I was just hoping, yes, I can absolutely <laughs> guess based on the way we have treated immigrants as the child of an immigrant, particularly. Ooh, I can guess. That I can down. guess. But. I don't want to guess. I want the person who's all right, done all the right. research all to right. explain to me all right. what was going on at the time that made it so that this happened. Why was it specifically about China Can and I not finish? someone Can else? I finish? Can I finish? Can I, I finish? feel like I have to defend myself because someone is writing scripts <laughs> that are shading me. So let's go. Let's, <laughs> let's keep our eyes on the prize. 
I'm going to shade you probably no matter what. So I, but I, you know, blanket apology about that. Anyway, why were, why was all this happening? Boiled down to, in the words of Trey Parker and Matt Stone, they took our jobs. So specifically about the fact that Chinese laborers were coming in being Chinese laborers. Yes. So uh, obviously that's an oversimplification uh, necessary to keep this episode length at bay, but like, that's kind of what most of this stuff always boils down to, right? Such as right now, that's a big concern is that immigrants are coming to this country and taking jobs of normal, hardworking Americans, blah, blah, blah. Uh, ethnic resentment is extremely reliable throughout history when populations experience economic difficulty. And the U.S. indeed did experience several recessions in the latter part of the 19th century, including one that is currently now called the Long Depression. From That's what I have. 1873 to 1896. I think it was technically a recession, but I didn't go into that too much. Um, and this was actually referred to as the Great Depression until... The Great Depression. The Great Depression stole its title. So Was it you, actually a bigger depression in the 20s as opposed to the 1800s? I, Is there a way to measure that? I believe that there's like... There, yeah, so yes, there are ways to track that via like economic indicators. Uh, and, I, and I believe that the Great Depression was more severe than... I'm not sure if it lasted longer, but it was more severe than the Long Depression. Gotcha. Uh, so you combine this with a few other factors, right? After the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, you have an absolute shit ton of skilled Chinese laborers that suddenly have no project to work on. Times are tough, and now skilled Chinese labor is taking, quote, your jobs. Furthermore, we mentioned before when we were talking about the push and pull of immigration, another interesting thing that I didn't realize before doing the work for this episode was that the conditions in a homeland not only affect motivation to emigrate, but they also affect the conditions of the diaspora in other countries. Oh, interesting. So in this case, since the Qing Chinese civilization was in decline during this time period and was spending all of its political energy on fending off colonization, it had very little diplomatic leverage to counter some of these draconian American immigration laws. So if you've ever wondered, like, why some countries' immigrants are valued more than others, yeah, some of it is economic and class resentment, i.e., like, poor people coming over. Some of it is racial resentment. But some of it is also just, like, the political clout of the immigrants' homeland. Hmm. In other words, the U.S. faces steeper diplomatic economic consequences, for example, for treating French immigrants like shit than it does for treating, like, you know, Colombian or Mexican immigrants like shit. Oh, fuck. It's also one part of why Chinese immigrants are in much better shape stepping on American soil today than they were in the 1800s. So to summarize, we have a Chinese diaspora now that is starting to be discriminated against in some pretty extreme ways at the top of the American government. And this was also true at the middle and the bottom as well. On top of the entry ban for their countrymen, Chinese Americans, like many other diasporas in America, Italian comes to mind, which you'll see the parallel here pretty shortly, face the dual problem of being neglected by governmental services and also being excluded and in some cases violently excluded from broader society. So, Kayla. Yes. You remember the first question we talked about at the beginning of the show today? What is a government? Right. Well, those functions of government that we talked about, specifically rule enforcement and mutual aid, I think are both critical to the functioning of a community, which is why I wanted to talk to you about them at the top of the show. Okay. So where there's a vacuum of those things, when, when the greater San Francisco, when the greater Los Angeles government neglects or refuses to provide those things, something will pop up on its own. That is extremely true. And as we know, that is why things like the Italian mafia exist. Yeah. As I just said, Italian immigrants may come to mind and you may see some parallels here. Enter oh, but, but to the story. Just to go back to that, the Italian mafia started in Italy for these same reasons. Right. It wasn't just Italian Americans coming here and not having right. that scaffolding. Right. It was also the failures in that particular country as well. So there's an analogy in the sense that there was a vacuum to fill at this sort of like governmental service level. Right. Um, but it was also different in some key ways as well, which we will see. Hmm. Enter the Chinese 
tongs. The word tong is Chinese for hall. Like H-A-L-L? H-A-L-L, like a meeting hall. Okay. Tongs are organizations unique to the Chinese diaspora, and especially the Chinese-American diaspora. They were formed as a direct result of the needs of Chinese immigrants to the United States, especially during this time period where Chinese immigrants had extreme challenges living here and no other American organization existed that was willing to support them. Here's Wikipedia again, quote, These associations often provide services for Chinatown communities, such as immigrant counseling, Chinese schools, and English classes for adults. Tongs follow the pattern of secret societies common to the southern China, and many are connected to a secret society called the Tiandihui, which follows this pattern. This is the dopest thing I've ever heard, because it's like a mini... Okay, it's a provider of services for a community that needs them and also a secret society. My two favorite things. Just wait. Oh, no. Other groups worldwide that follow this pattern and are connected with the Tiandihui are known as Hui, Hongmen, which we mentioned before, and Triads, which, again, broad term, but it you know refers to other groups that have this similar sort of like secret society structure to them. End quote. So for those of you keeping track of the secret society lineage at home, it went roughly White Lotus Society, Tianjuhui slash Hongmen, Chinese American Tongs. This is cool. Yeah, this whole thing really tickled my history funny bone. And like this, that's why like when I started reading about it, when right. we walked by the other day, I was just like, oh, oh Yeah, I have man. to ask because you, because here's what happened. We walked by this building. It had the name on it. It said members only. I went, what's that? And you went, I don't know. And I went, I bet there's something to that. And then we sat down on a bench and you Googled it and then you put it away and you were like, nah, it's nothing. And I was like, I don't believe no, it's. No, 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 yes, no. I said, yes. don't. I said, don't look it up. No. Because I wanted to do it. No, because, no, you, no, literally, you Googled it and went, I don't know if there's something here. And I prodded you again. You kept reading. Then your eyes got all big and you went, don't look it up. Don't look it up. Oh, and okay. I, I forgot know that bit. What made your eyes go big? I mean, any number of the things that I just okay. spent time talking about. You don't remember about. exactly what it was. I don't remember exactly what it was, okay. but it might have been this. It might have been the like, like the chain of lineage sure. for like, you know, going back to like secret size. I mean, you know that I always like to smuggle history into this podcast anyway. Yeah. So I'm totally doing that here. Um, here's another quote about Chinese tongs. This time I'm going to read to you the significant statement for none other than the Hop Sing Tong in L.A.'s Chinatown, the one you and I saw the other day. I'm not sure exactly what a significant statement is, but I imagine it's probably something you have to submit to be considered as a historic resource where I got this quote, which was the Los Angeles Historic Resources Inventory. Ooh. On the web, that's historicplacesla.org. And by the way, while this particular Hop Sing Tong is a chapter in Los Angeles, like most larger tongs, it has branches in multiple cities. Boise... Denver, San Francisco, Portland, San Jose, Seattle, and a few others. Wow. Anyway, the significant statement for the Hop Sing Tong Hall in L.A. reads as follows, quote, Significant as a Chinese benevolent association in Los Angeles' Chinatown, the National Hop Sing Tong Society was established in 1875 in San Francisco. A Los Angeles chapter was in operation by the 1890s. Oh my God, is that old? Yes. Wow. Chinese benevolent associations are charitable organizations established to provide for the needs of Chinese immigrants, such as social welfare and cultural activities, in order to preserve the culture and traditions of Chinese people. Benevolent associations were often organized around villages or surnames, serving immigrants who shared a common dialect or place of origin. The Hop Sing Tong Benevolent Association continues to operate at this location. End quote. So it's been there since that one that we walked by has been there since 1890? The organization has been there since 1890. I can't say for sure whether that building has, but it okay. actually it kind of sounds like it has. It may or may not because the only reason I say maybe, maybe not is because I learned today that the original Chinatown that was established in Los Angeles was demolished to make way for Union Station oh. and reestablished where it currently resides as New Chinatown. In that case, it almost certainly was not there 
in 1890. It was probably back in the old location. Hmm. It was if I had to guess before New Chinatown was established there. It was Sonora Town, hmm. and it was where many immigrants from Sonora, Mexico, ended up. I did not know that. That's what I learned today. And that's the story of Hop Sing Tong, the place we walked by the other day. What did I, you think? Any questions? I feel like there's more. Hmm? I feel like I'm just leaning over right here. What? I'm looking at your no, script. You shouldn't be spying. And I feel like you're only halfway through. You should through. just be listening. I'm spying. And I... Uh, you should... I, actually, you know You're just talking. I don't even, you're just reacting. You shouldn't be spying on my script. I don't even need to see your script. I know that there's more. <laughs> what? By the way that I asked that question? Just by the way, I know how the world works. Well, my friend, you are correct. Oh, my God. For once I, in my life. Le- this is the first time. Mark your calendar, everyone. Uh, but yes, I have not yet gotten to a big part of the story. What's the big part of the story? Please tell me quickly. A big part. Please. Not the big part. A big part. Please tell me fast. I need to know. We've already been sort of dancing around and hinting at this. I guess heavily hinting in some cases. Oh my god. Another crucial aspect of Tongs. Remember when I said a hot minute ago that Chinese immigrants and their tongs reminded me of Italian immigrants in particular, and you talked about the mafia? Were we talking to talk about organized crime here? It's a familiar story, because we've heard it before. An immigrant group comes to America, finds opposition to their very existence, and ordinary government services are essentially withheld, and in this vacuum something else springs up. The Italian mafia also provided crucial immigrant services to early Italian Americans. Mafia gets a bad rap, you guys. Including government-oriented services like dispute arbitration and protection services. I don't actually think that the mafia gets a bad rap. I just think it gets an inaccurate rap. Hold on to that thought for basically this whole episode. Oh my god. So the thing is, when you're providing these services, when you're providing something like a protection service, right, it is by definition extra-legal. In sure. context of the right. larger society in which they operate. It's very necessary due to the neglect of said larger society, but it is extra legal. And like attracts like in that sense. If you're operating extra legally in one area, say protection racketeering, you might be more likely to specialize in other activities outside the law. Hmm. Tongs operated in this way as well, which is interesting because their overseas organizational cousins, the triads, found themselves specializing in criminal activity as well, but for different reasons. I guess they're actually similar reasons if you broaden that to say, to be like, because they were doing stuff that was either prohibited by law or monopolized by government. So I guess triads and tongs are similar in that way. But but like the way the British government viewed triads in Hong Kong was different than how tongs got started doing criminal activity in America. Okay. So yes, tongs provided a bevy of services to Chinese American immigrants. Welfare, employment, translation, social and cultural connection, even the act of immigration itself. And actually, here's a quick side story about that. There was a practice Tongs participated in called Paper Sons or Paper Daughters, in which someone in China would adopt the surname of a sponsor in the U.S. in order to immigrate here and bypass the Chinese Exclusion Act, becoming the son or daughter of that sponsor, but only on paper. Hence, Paper Sons or Daughters. Hmm. Tongs also provided mutual aid services that typically the government, the official government would consider monopolized, protection and dispute arbitration and enforcement. The protection services, in fact, forced almost every citizen and business in Chinatowns across the U.S. to belong to at least one local Tong. And it wasn't long before Tongs also began to specialize in other illegal vice activities, especially the, quote, big three of drugs, gambling, in prostitution. Are we going to get in trouble? Let's talk about each of those in turn. I don't know. We might get murdered. We'll see. I don't want to get murdered. We probably won't get murdered. Are you going to post pictures of the thing on the Instagram? (laughs) Should we not? (laughs) I mean, the sign was there for anyone to see. Uh, I think it's okay if we take a picture of a building in Chinatown. (laughs) But, you know, I don't know. We'll see. That's Chinatown, baby. That's the line (laughs) from the iconic movie Chinatown. As you'll all recognize it, that's Chinatown, baby. That's, yeah. That's the line. Uh, So I actually don't have a heck of a lot to say about the drug trade in Tongs, other than opium trade was indeed the drug trade of choice, which is where you get the, like, semi-derogatory term opium den from. Uh, Like the other two major vice trades, the drug trade was extremely lucrative, 
Uh, and in one source I read said that at its peak in the mid to late 1800s, somewhere between 16 to 40 percent of the Chinese American populations of Chinatowns were dependent on opium in some way. Wow. Why was this the case? Well, remember that Page Act of 1875 that we mentioned a little while ago? Do I? The one that prohibited Chinese women from immigrating to the United States? Yeah. Yeah, so early Chinatowns were what I saw referred to over and over again as, quote, bachelor societies. The ratio of men to women in San Francisco's Chinatown, I saw estimates as low as 10 to 1 and as high as 20 to 1. That's terrifying. 20 Chinese men to one Chinese woman in these Chinatowns. So you have a bunch of male bachelors with money to burn, and one of the things that they burn it on is drugs. Sure. Which quite naturally segues me to the second big vice trade that Tongs were involved in, which was prostitution. Obviously, in a 20 to 1 situation, there's going to be a very high demand for sex work by the 20 side of the equation. And I say prostitution purposefully here rather than sex work because let's just say that it was not typically the case that this was something Chinese women were doing voluntarily. So forced prostitution. According to one source I read, the sex trade in American Chinatowns was more brutal than your average sex trade of the time, which is saying something. The foundation for the sex trade for certain tongs, which this is probably a good time to bring up that while all tongs were involved in some way in all sorts of businesses across town, they tended to specialize when it came to the vices. So mm. one tong might be more specialized as a gambling hall, where another might be more specialized in, say, the opium trade. Okay. Anyway, the foundation for the sex trade for such tongs was unfortunately primarily trafficking from mainland China and quite literal sex slavery, Jeez. complete with auction-style purchasing of women from China. Horrible. It was, as we say, not good. No. And this is why governments should do a good job of taking care of the people that live under them mm -hmm. because otherwise things like this happen the third major vice trade category is gambling which is the most complicated of the three to talk about because the fact is gambling much more so than the others is one of those criminal activities that is especially dependent on social context in chinese culture particularly southern china gambling is not even considered a vice the way it is in america where we are like somewhat descended from puritans it's simply part of the fabric of their culture. One interview with a Chinese author that I read for this episode actually had a really interesting insight about this. The following quote is from uh, that interview, the one that I read. Uh, the author's name is Bill Lee. Uh, he was actually a former uh, Tong and gang member in Chinatown, uh, I believe in San Francisco. <clears throat> he wrote a book called Chinese Playground, a memoir about, about those experiences. Here's what he has to say about Chinese gambling culture. Quote, there is also the fact that gambling is very prevalent in Chinese culture because it has always been accepted and perceived as a social activity. That's where you go and gather with friends. The other part of it is that, especially in southern China, most people from that region tend to be very poor farmers. Things are so unpredictable there that you could build your home and plant your crops, and a typhoon or a monsoon comes along and wipes everything out. You have to start from scratch. My own theory is that when you have those types of challenges... You also have the dynamics of gambling being acceptable. People tend to be very superstitious. Hmm. There's not much they have in the first place, and they're very willing to try their luck. End quote. It's such a neat little insight, isn't it? Yeah, that makes sense. You don't hear that kind of take yeah. often. Right. Here. Right. Uh, obviously, I don't think that's like the single one true reason gambling is important to Chinese culture. Sure. But I think he makes like a pretty strong case for like that being part of it. In any case, it's this cultural context that makes the illegal gambling aspect of tongs kind of hard to put in an ethical box. Like, sex slaves are pretty obviously horrific, but providing a service that has such cultural meaning and provides social glue doesn't sound so bad. Well, uh, it's like sex slavery, pretty clearly you are infringing on the rights of a human being. Right. Gambling and drugs, less so. Gambling especially when you consider gambling with a like cultural relevance even less so right exactly 
And hell, if we disparage Mahjong, then like we also have to disparage Las Vegas, right? Well, I mean, I can least. sit here and disparage Las Vegas. Okay, if, but if you really want, but for different reasons, <laughs> not for the craps tables, because it's it's okay. Well, let's talk about classic Vegas, kitschy and plastic life with the Italian mafia. <laughs> that, that's true too. There, there's there you go again with the uh, extra legal immigrant based crime syndicates. I mean, perhaps we could say that it's like worthy of punishment still in this case, because maybe it opens the door for other more socially negative criminal activity. It's hard, maybe impossible to say. So the point here isn't really to make some like ethical call on gambling, but rather just to shine a bit of a brighter and more complete light on one aspect of Tong activity. Okay. I'd also venture to say that as with the protection racketeering and some of the other extra legal social services that were going on, there may be some chicken-egg confusion here with criminal activity. In other words, did Tongs broadly engage in criminal activity because they were criminal or criminal-adjacent organizations? Or did they engage in criminal activity because essential services that they arose to provide, such as protection, were unfairly criminalized? Right, right. It's a bit of chicken-egg. And I think, you know, again, you can say that for other similar organizations like the Mafia. Like, there's a lot to criticize, but... You know, if these communities were being taken care of with the expected governmental services from the city of San Francisco or the city of Los Angeles, then would have would this have even happened? I mean, it's this that you look at the gang, the correct. You look at the more classically recognized gangs of Los Angeles, and those exist for also similar reasons. Right. Right. Lack of governmental infrastructure, lack of lack of social services, lack of this and the other, lack of protection, lack of these 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 groups pop up for reasons right. that are not entirely like people are bad like yeah we kind of are taught as children what's interesting to me for that too is that i feel like some of the it's like similar but different right if you the the similar reason is you can't trust the established governmental authority to take care of these needs that's the similar reason the different reason i think is it feels to me like with Chinatowns, it was more the result of neglect. Right. Whereas with, say, like black communities in LA, it was maybe more the result of the and the law of enforcement being like a negative influence. Like it's not that law enforcement wasn't in, you know, Watts. It was that law enforcement was there and you don't go to law enforcement to take care of things because they're worse than the problem. Which I would argue is a form of neglect. The needs are neglected. Just because the needs are neglected, a presence, but the needs are still neglected. Yes, but it, it's a different flavor because instead of being like, eh, let them do their own thing, it's there's like an active element to it. Right. The other problem that black market economics tends to create, as we know, is turf warfare. Kayla, if you and I have a business dispute, legal avenues and enforcement exist to settle those disputes. If you and I have a business dispute, but we ourselves are the legal avenues and enforcement. What happens then? Did that make sense? Say it again. If you and I have a business dispute, but there's no legal entity above us to help arbitrate, rather you and I are the legal avenues ourselves. Like, let's say you're the head of Tong A and I'm the head of Tong B. Right. We're each providing legal sort of like pseudo enforcement services. But what happens when we have a dispute? Right. There's no board above you. Right. So this brings us to the so-called Tong Wars, which were a long-running series of disputes among Tongs in every major Chinatown in America. This primarily took place around the late 1800s, and in San Francisco, with the country's largest Chinatown, it didn't cool off until the mid-1920s. Dang. These disputes were over what you might expect. The phrase I liked from my research was that they called them inter-gang grievances, And this was things like disputed payments between Tongs or members, honor-related grievances. So these are things like like the desecration of the deceased, which was supposed to be something that, like, you didn't do even in, you know, the criminal world. Sure. uh, Or revenge for murdered members. Along with the cooling of the Tong Wars, Tong influence in Chinatowns in the first part of the 20th century also waned, largely due to the increasing Americanization of American Chinese, both from the simple passage of time and also from the ever-increasing number of American-born Chinese. This all changed, however, with a new wave of Chinese immigration to America in the 1960s. What I found super interesting was that, just as with the immigration wave in the 1800s, the political and economic situation in both the home country and the destination country were what drove the immigration, 
both in terms of how and when it happened. In China, the Cultural Revolution of Mao Zedong would be getting underway in 1966, and we don't have the time, again, don't have the time to get into it. That'll uh, be on our spin-off podast. <laughs> there, this could be a million spin-off podcast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but let's just say it was not great for your average Chinese citizen. It was bad, bad times. So there's your immigration push. You also had pull from the United States because the Chinese Exclusion Acts were finally abolished in 1965. I'm sorry. Yeah, 60 years. Wait, no. 80 years after? They went on that long. 65, yeah. If you were okay, in 1964. I know we had a relationship with China for, for well into the 1900s, obviously. I just didn't know that the well, acts lasted this long. So, yeah, I mean, that's, again, don't have the time to go into all the details, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like that entire 80-year period there was no change and then suddenly there was. There were other smaller steps that happened in between then. Um, in particular, Tricky Dick. We were allied with. When did no, Tricky well, Dick come in? I, Tricky Dick was was later. He was, I think, nineteen seventy. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were allied with China in the Second World War. Right. So, like, there there was some. I don't remember exactly what, but some reduction in this uh, in these horrible anti-immigration acts with China gotcha. happened during that time period. But nineteen sixty five was when like that act was finally abolished. So what these combined forces give you is a new wave of Chinese immigrants. And what's interesting and also kind of tragic here is that because these immigrations happened in such large but punctuated waves, in other words, you had like a bunch in the 1800s and then it slowed to a trickle thanks to the racist laws. And then the faucet opened up wide again in the 60s. You had a large population of Americanized and American-born Chinese people that were suddenly mixing with new immigrants from Hong Kong and China. And this created conflict and opportunity and renewed interest and vigor from the Chinatown Tongs. They had never fully gone away, but they found a new lifeblood starting in the 60s, which unfortunately went hand in hand with an increase in criminal activity for similar reasons as before. Let's briefly talk about San Francisco as an example. The city of San Francisco still basically didn't give a shit about Chinatown or these new Chinese immigrants either, and left them essentially to their own devices. So the conditions that gave power to the Tongs back in the 1800s were essentially the same. Immigrants still needed support. Citizens of Chinatown still needed rule enforcement and protection and mutual aid. Official American institutions still didn't care to provide any of that. So this mix of new immigration wave, plus continued neglect, plus these power structures that the Tongs existed within already, proved to be a volatile combination, culminating in San Francisco in an incident called the Golden Dragon Massacre. Oh no, I don't like that word. On September 4th, 1977, in retaliation for a murdered gang member and a previous dispute over illegal fireworks trade, which, by the way, we we mentioned the other three vices. By this time, though, uh, illegal fireworks had become an extremely lucrative trade in San Francisco and other Chinatowns. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Uh, members of a gang called the Joe Boys entered the Golden Dragon restaurant. Their target was the leader of the Wa Ching gang, whom the assassins had been tipped off would be present there during that time. They walked into the Golden Dragon, tragically full of diners, and indiscriminately opened fire. That's not how you... A, everybody don't kill people, first of all. <laughs> that's, the, that's the stance of this don't podcast. Kill we are anti- we're, we're anti-murder murder here. across the board. But... Just leave other people out of it, man. Yeah. So while there were opposing Joe Boy and other gang members present, none of them died. Gang survivors said that the difference between them and the rest of the restaurant's patrons was that they had the street instinct to just hit the deck in time. Hmm. The innocent bystanders were not so savvy or lucky. Five people were killed and 11 wounded in the massacre, which has been called, quote, The worst mass murder in San Francisco history. Jeez. Which is interesting because I had never heard of it until doing this research. Same. In the aftermath of this incident, the city of San Francisco finally started to pay attention to Chinatown and created the Chinatown and what was later called Asian Task Force, which a New York Times article later credited with cleaning up gang-related violence in San Francisco Chinatown by 1983. Knowing what we know today about policing in America, it's difficult to imagine that this was the sole result of said task force. 
And it's equally difficult to imagine that said cleanup was conducted in a way that was like super awesome for the Chinese American community in San Francisco. But that's just my own commentary. It's not from the New York Times investigation. According to that, this task force, quote unquote, cleaned up gang activity there. Yeah, the phrase cleaning up or cleaned up is very fraught and yeah. potentially like triggering. <laughs> like right. You uh, hear the word cleaned up and you kind of go like, oh, what happened? Yeah. Um, but it's a very sanitized. The re- word. Yeah. The, so the, the real shift here was that. A, innocent people died. B, some of them were tourists and C, it really depressed the the revenue in Chinatown. Mm. Uh, so like immediate, like the day after it happened, there was like a mass like cancellation of, of dinner reservations. Sure, and sure. like nobody was on the streets and nobody was buying things. Right. And nobody was like in Chinatowns tend to depend as much as they de- as much as the tongs depend on some of these other like vice trades. Right. Chinatowns in general depend on tourism sure. for their revenue and their lifeblood. So this was like finally a thing where it was like, oh, fuck, we got to do something here. It's actually something kind of interesting that you'll notice if you like Google the Chinatown in Los Angeles is that you'll get simultaneously a lot of hits on like Chinatown is a vibrant community with like lots of restaurants and places to go out and like come visit. And also people being afraid of like, is Chinatown dangerous? Talking about like the quote unquote gang activity in Chinatown, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. being saying things like, oh, you know, this part of Chinatown is safe, but this part isn't. And don't go out at night. Mah, mah, mah. So it's like this interesting mix of like fear over alleged gang activity which Mm -hmm. i don't i don't know anything about that in los angeles current chinatown but you juxtapose that with also the like let's have tourists come in and stuff right my understanding is that is mostly cultural memory Hmm. Like, it's mostly historical. It's mostly thinking back to things like, you know, something like the Golden Dragon Massacre is going to loom large for a long time in people's minds. Sure. But I also got the impression that it's not, like, totally crime-free these days. Right. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But regardless, by the end of the decade of the 70s, the period of gang violence in Chinatowns across the U.S. had largely died down either way. Oh, and I neglected to mention one thing. Uh-oh. About the Golden Dragon Restaurant. Okay. It was owned by none other than San Francisco's Hop Sing Tong. Oh, damn. Which was the San Francisco branch of the building that you and I walked by the other day. Not only that, some of the other gang members present were members of a group called the Hop Sing Boys, which was a youth group slash, like, enforcement arm of the Hop Sing Tong in San Francisco. A youth group slash enforcement arm. Well, that's what a gang is, right? It's just interesting. I mean, gangs yeah, tend to gangs, recruit youths, yeah, sadly. It's, it's just interesting to see it phrased as youth group slash. Well, I phrased it that way, but that's... It's still interesting to hear phrased that way. Yeah. It's an interesting phrasing. Yeah, yeah. Let's round out our historical journey of Chinatown Tongs by talking about the late 90s and 2000s. I want to bring up the late 90s because... And this is analysis, by the way, that I'm stealing from a National Geographic documentary that I watched about this topic. But there's another example of politics and economics of a home country affecting events in a destination country. In this case, the transfer of Hong Kong from British to Chinese rule in 1997 triggered a wave of Hong Kong triads to pick up and move due to their fear of extreme crackdown measures once Hong Kong's laws were being enforced by the Chinese Communist Party instead of the British. Interesting. So this led to like another mini crime wave in West Coast Chinatowns in the late 90s. Although to be clear, by this point, we're getting away from talking about like tongs and Chinese immigration. And we're just talking purely about how geopolitics affects movement of people and organizations and crime patterns. But I found it. Yeah, I found that interesting that like those geopolitical events affecting things in this like interesting way. You found it interesting that things were affected in an interesting way? In this way. And I'm going to cut out that part. No, it's funny. No. And finally, let's zoom all the way to today, which for anyone that's too young or to, that's We're the, here. Ooh, that's the time travel on culture just weird sound. <laughs> so for anyone that's too young or doesn't remember the 80s and 90s, China was not the economic powerhouse that it is today. China has seen extreme economic growth in the past 20 years. And that has fundamentally changed the nature of Chinese immigration to the United States. And our media and government has been terrified of that since it started 20 years ago. Or before. <laughs> uh, not only are there more robust services for newly arrived immigrants than there were in the 1800s, 
But whereas in the 1800s and 1860s, most Chinese immigrants were poorer classes seeking survival and opportunity overseas, in the 2020s, Chinese immigrants are comprised more and more of middle and upper class than they have been in the past. On top of that, as we mentioned earlier in the show, the diplomatic clout of the mother country actually has quite an effect on how immigrants are treated here in a destination country, and the scales have tipped quite a bit in favor of China since the 1800s in that regard as well. Altogether, what this means is actually that Chinese immigrants now actually primarily don't even settle in, say, LA's Chinatown, and existing Chinese American populations have also been suburbanizing. Here in Southern California, the San Gabriel Valley has multiple robust and vibrant Chinatowns in cities like Alhambra, Arcadia, and Monterey Park. Again, I have to point out here for the third or fourth time this episode how interesting it is when the conditions in the home country and the destination country have such a huge impact on how and when immigrations happen. Right. Anyway, as always, with a change in settlement patterns, unfortunately, comes geographic winners and losers. Today, only Manhattan and Chicago's Chinatowns are currently experiencing growth. Elsewhere, they are in decline in terms of population and economics. This is something that communities have tried to counter in various ways, which I think is a really good thing because Chinatowns in America, to me, are just like so full and of historical magic. They're just right. like rich with historical magic. They have such an important place in this country. So I'm glad that like that's people are trying to figure out how to like preserve them. Right. In Los Angeles, as we experienced recently, some of this decay has been fought with what I saw referred to as bohemian style gentrification, which means things like artist enclaves and hip foodie joints. Of course, this has its pros and cons, but again, I feel like a broken record here. This isn't an episode about the very complex topic of gentrification, so we kind of <laughs> have to just breeze by it. But it what is, is relevant to this episode is that ultimately tongs are not a central feature of Chinese American life the way they once were, and their involvement in criminal activity has waned alongside their prominence. It's interesting because the population of Chinatown is considered to be an aging, quote unquote, an aging population. Right. And it's there's actually, um, there are a lot of localized social movements that are attempting to aid that community. Like the local, for example, the local DSA branch does a lot of work with the aging population in Chinatown. Interesting. Or does some work. I don't want to say a lot of work, but does work specifically just regarding the fact that Chinatown has a lot of quote unquote low income housing. And it was originally a place where there was like low income housing. And now that population is aging. There's not a lot of immigration into that part of, of Los Angeles. Um, so it's just right. interesting to think about how, how that might affect that area in 10, 15, 20 years. Right. Absolutely. Uh, here's an excerpt from an article in San Francisco magazine to help sort of illustrate this whole point. Quote, Chow, who was the interview subject of this article, points out that in the past, the Chinese cultural tradition of Mahjong was vigorously policed for its connection to gangs and gambling. But over time, many of the Mahjong parlors were supplanted by out-of-town casinos. Just down the street from Chow's Tong, in fact, a travel agency is advertising casino-bound shuttles. As the gamblers went elsewhere, the gangs moved on as well, and law enforcement's attitude toward Mahjong eventually relaxed. Other criminal activities have declined as well. Brothels mostly disappeared when prostitution became a largely online operation conducted by independent contractors. Illegal lotteries have been replaced by the state-run system, and opium is no longer in demand, though other drugs linked to Chinese gangs still are. Now, Chow says, Tongs make their money from the management of their historic land holdings. A Tsingtao Daily Reporter says, quote, Each Tong owns different buildings. They make money from renting out their buildings. Some are apartments. Others are for business use, and the Tongs use the money for the community, events for the seniors, and for the Chinese people living in Chinatown. Didn't, quote. didn't I point at the top of that building and go, is there apartments up there? Yeah, so I think, and I, I mean, I think Tongs were also like halfway houses for immigrants for a long time that as well. makes sense, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I got the impression that Tongs today are more like Masonic lodges. Like, okay i.e. like social clubs for older folk more than they are like criminal. Sure. Although some would disagree. I've seen it said that just because we don't see illegal activity as much doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just hidden or handled peacefully, right? It doesn't erupt in violence, so we don't hear about it. When it's also like the phrase criminal activity is very broad. 
Mm-hmm. Like criminal activity can refer to anything extra legal. Like, I don't know. I, I just, I don't think there's in the, in current Los Angeles Chinatown, for example, where the population is aging, I can't imagine there's the same level of facilitating the big three vices that we talked about, for example. Right. Uh, I mean, I, the quote that I just read was from San Francisco about right. how those things had sort of migrated away. But I imagine that those patterns are similar in other cities such as our own. Right. However, sometimes the violence still does peak above the surface on occasion. Ooh. As a matter of fact, in the Los Angeles Hop Sing Tong, the very beautiful building we walked by the other day that is mostly a place for elderly Chinatown residents to play mahjong and feel at home, was host to a double murder only as recently as January of 2017. The two victims died at the end of a knife blade, and one of them, I shit you not, was the president of that very same Hop Sing Tong. Oh, no. Uh, If we didn't have our gimmick criteria to do, that would have been, like, a good outro moment. Let's skip the criteria. What a shame. Last episode, we shucked all tradition and declared the topic a religion, so we could just go (laughs) ahead and just be like, no criteria today. No criteria for this one. There are no rules. Do what you want. Um, but that does bring us to the end of the story of Hop Sing and other American tongs. What do you think, Kayla? What do I think? What's my... What's my? Yeah, what's your, what's your quick take? Quick take. My off the cuff, off the hip, shooting from the hip. Shooting from the hip, Off take. the back, skin of my teeth. How do you feel about No skin things. off my back. Yeah. Oops, cutting off my nose despite my face. <laughs> Uh, I would say it's not a cult, personally, Mm. just without having gone through all of the criteria. But perhaps you can guide us through those steps and stages and we can arrive at a same or different answer. We will get to that. Um, I just there are a few things that I did want to sort of I don't really have like a well-defined script about this, but there are just some bits that I want to talk about because I do think that it's there's some interesting sort of like themes here to me like first of all i think it's really interesting that there's these parallels between tongs and other secret societies right like in some ways it seems similar to freemasons and that it's like this social club right in other ways it seems like wildly different in some ways it seems similar to mafia because it has these underworld connections but then in some ways it seems wildly different because it's more about like they're very specifically like immigrant halfway houses, immigrant right, right. help. That's like why they were created. Um, and I also think that like, there's a big element here of like good or bad. Who's to say like one of the points I think I really want to make that I was just sort of thinking about when I was writing this was like, I don't want, I don't want to like make a call here. Like, Oh man, tongs are bad. Cause criminal stuff, because the immigrants that they helped, That was a very necessary service that they provided. Yeah, you can't really look at organized crime, particularly in this country, and go like, that's bad, without understanding, like, there's there's a lot of nuance. There's there's bad things, there's good things, there's neutral things, it's just... But at the same time, I also don't want to, like, minimize victims of some of the things that the Tongs were involved in. Like, the Golden Dragon Massacre is pretty bad and the victims there were i believe either four out of five or five out of five of them of the deceased were asian americans right so you know and then there's also like all of the victims of the sex trafficking that was right. was happening so like on one hand i want to say like man it's a good thing that they were there to help immigrants and be a you know community center right but on the other hand it's like Ugh, but a lot of negative stuff a happened lot of people too. Were hurt so, in the process. yeah, exactly. So it's just it's a very complex topic, fraught and nuanced. Yes, and which also is the new like, tagline of this show. Out- <laughs> fraught yet not nuanced. Fraught and unnuanced. We're just a bull in a fraught and straightforward as hell, baby. It's Chinatown, baby. <laughs> uh, and then the other sort of like big theme thing that I just I don't know why I hadn't really seen this as clearly before, but how immigration is so inextricably tied to events in home and destination countries. Sure. Right. And like when I think about now that I'm like looking for it, you kind of see it everywhere. Like, oh, yeah, potato famine in Ireland. Now you have a bunch of people of Irish descent on the East Coast of America. Right. Right. So there's just it's it's really interesting how geopolitical events affect the movements of human beings and how they do and who moves where and what happens to them. 
the United States stages a coup in South America and suddenly. <laughs> All right, Kayla, before we get to the criteria, got to do the obligatory interjection of research sources. There we go. The Baby, this is what I've been waiting for the whole time. Yeah, everybody part. wants the mm-hmm. sources. Juicy, juicy administrative stuff. <laughs> It's me taking bites. I consulted the following resources. Of course, Wikipedia articles on Chinese secret societies, Tongs, Chinese wars of conquest, rebellions, criminal organizations, immigration, just all the things. So many Wikipedia articles. Uh, also a website that I mentioned called historicplacesla.org, a place called Found SF, which is a digital historical archive for the city of San Francisco, sanfran.com, the Encyclopedia of Chicago online, villagevoice.com, the SF Weekly online archives, mafianj.com, that's New Jersey, NJ, americanhistoryusa.com, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, National Geographic's documentary entitled Chinatown Mafia, available on YouTube, Uh, another podcast, the China History Podcast, specifically episodes 171, 172, and 173, which is a three-parter on the Tong Wars of New York's Chinatown. If you want to get some of the sweet, sweet details that we kept saying we were going to gloss over in this episode today, this dude goes into details like baller details. So it was a great listen if you want a finer grained picture on this topic. And finally, I got a little bit of help from a good friend of mine. Kayla, you know him. He was at my wedding party. Uh, I got some help from him in this episode because of his perspective as a Chinese American himself. Dope. All right. So is it a cult or not? Take us through. Charismatic leader. No idea. <laughs> I know. I love that that was like, it's like our first criteria and sometimes there just isn't one. I, 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 it doesn't seem like there is an overall charismatic leader. Probably in individual halls, there may have been leaders that were charismatic, but I cannot say that overall we can point to a singular charismatic leader. Yeah. I If you narrow it down to like, a particular hall or even like maybe a particular Chinatown at a particular time. Right. There were definitely like mob bosses like of, of, you know, some renown that we could have covered in this episode. And we just kind of didn't, because I think if you think about like, if, if the topic is hop, hop sing tong or American tongs, there isn't like one single leader that like, yeah, exactly. So there's, you know, they've had multiple like, there's no teal swan. There's no romtha. Yeah, exactly. So low zero, but some of these guys, I mean, some of the, obviously the mob bosses oh, sure. are pretty charismatic. Uh, expected harm. There's some expected help, but also <sighs> definitely some expected harm. Like we Maybe just we talked about. We should have about. expected help. Because <laughs> it's like, again, this is, an, this is, in the context of this episode, this is an un-nuanced criteria. Right. But I think the answer is, hmm, I think. At a certain point in history, the answer's high, maybe now low. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think maybe we'll just say medium. Yeah, it's hard to say. I agree. Um, because as we just got done discussing, you know, they provided all kinds of necessary services for Chinese American immigrants, but they also did a lot of harm in a lot of cases. So uh, unclear, I think. Maybe medium is fine. Medium. Uh, presence of ritual. We didn't talk about this a lot, but actually there were some initiation rituals involved because they are secret societies. Yeah, I'm going to say it's a secret society is kind of built in. And also if there's gang activity, it is also built in. Yeah. So like a lot of triads have initiation rituals. A lot of these tongs had initiation rituals. Um, And I think I I would even also point out here that one of the little red flag things, one of the little like there's something going on there things that we saw was there was a little logo. Remember that little like star logo and a members only sign and a members only sign. So if you're gonna if you're gonna become a member, there's probably ritual involved, (laughs) right? Uh, Niche within society. I would say yes. Yes and no. I think within larger American society, maybe yes. But if you're if if society is Chinatown, like where it was operating, no, then definitely not. Actually, but I feel like we're looking at larger American society here. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. What do you think? It's your topic. I think Medium. that the spirit of this of this question is about like whether a group of people might see something as being 
normalized versus deviant. Mm -hmm. And I think that in order to properly answer that question, I think the right population to ask about is Chinatown, not larger American society. All right. Because so larger let's American go. society let's at this time. Car. Well, let's large... drive We're... and ask them. <laughs> I think larger American society at the time might have said that like Chinatown itself is niche. Like there's sure. a bunch of American stuff and some of it's Chinese. I think that if we're talking about it, the tongs, I think it's most logical to ask that question as being within American Chinatowns, in which case I would say not niche. Not niche. Got it. Antifactuality. Doesn't seem like it's there. Yeah. They weren't like, they weren't truth bending. They were law bending. Yeah. Uh, life consumption. Probably high. Yeah. If you were, it, it, it kind of depends. If you were somebody that needed them as a halfway house, high. obviously high. If you were, you know, one of the Hop Sing boys that had like pledged your, sure. you know, your, your life personhood to, yeah. yeah, to the gang, pretty high. Uh, dogmatic beliefs. I don't know. I don't like it. I don't think that there it's some of these are hard to answer because being a secret society, it's like, I don't sure, know what, sure. what went on in there. Like they played Mahjong, I guess. <laughs> um, but I didn't get the impression that there were like a set of correct insider outsider type belief systems going on here. Gotcha. Like I know that some of the like ancestral organizations were like secret religious sects and they might have some dogma going on. But as far as Tongs specifically, they... Uh, they followed the structure, but I don't think they had, like, dogmas. Interesting. I think. Okay. And then chain of victims. I don't know. I keep saying I don't know. I don't... Wow, you are not doing your job. I know. <laughs> it's just hard. It's a hard job. Well, and I we also... I didn't... Hold on. Somewhere. I didn't answer all these fully. Like, I didn't tell you about some of the, like, initiation rituals and stuff, so... I'm going to say chain of victims. So that refers to, like, recruitiness. Like, does one person recruit another, recruit another, such that we lose track of who's the victim and who's the abuser? I, I don't get the sense of that, but I do get the sense of kind of, like, if you are somebody coming, if you are someone immigrating, you are going to pass through this place. Yeah, I think I'm going to say low Just here for victim me. Victim is a hard word. I think there was definitely victims. Obviously, there are victims of, of some of the, you know, criminal activities that were, were happening I don't think, though, that I don't get the impression of, like, chain of recruiting. I don't sure. I don't get the, like, evangelical sense. Like, yeah, yeah, that's You true. definitely had to join a Tong at a certain point in time if you're a Chinese immigrant or own, particularly if you owned a business, right? You had to join a Tong right. because you had to have that protection service. But it didn't mean that you had to, like, then go out and, like, evangelize about that Tong. Get like, three there was... guys to give you money and then they'll yeah. have their downline. And, right. It yeah. wasn't a pyramidal structure. It was a flat relatively flat structure like zumba it was a what do you call it hexagon no trapezoid it was a trapezoidal gotcha. structure so zumba <laughs> the tong halls very similar entities yeah obviously um so the only one that we really oh actually no sorry we score relatively high on life actually consumed. yeah uh, presence of ritual and life consumption and then expected harm was Medium. mixed to me, this indicates we are we do not have a cult on our hands. Just something, a fascinating piece of history that still has vestiges and appearances today. Right. I agree. And I even think that like in their, you know, heyday, uh, I wouldn't even necessarily call it a cult. I think it it's the type of thing that like makes the cut for the show for a couple of reasons. Is one is it's like, ooh, secret society, right. like that and automatically kind of gets it in the about. door. Yeah. Yeah. And two, it's just like it was just a really interesting story sure. and really interesting history. So again, kinda wanna smuggle that in there whenever I can. Yep. Um, but ultimately it seems pretty clearly to be not a cult. You heard it here first. Yeah. Tom so Hall. But I don't have anything else. That's it. If you're ever All in done. Los Angeles or San Francisco or any major city that may or may not have a Chinatown, go check it out. Eat some food, buy some things, and uh, keep your eyes Check out the peeled. Chinatown. The Tong is members only, so I'm I don't just, know if you'll be able to get in. I wasn't in. done. Oh, sorry. Keep your eyes peeled for a interesting building with a members only sign. That's right. Well, hopefully you learned some cool stuff here today, and like I said, I will send, I will post a link on the show notes for 
stopaapihate.org. And thank you, everyone, for listening. This is Kayla. And this is Chris. And this has been... Cult or Just Weird. Thank you.